Hi everybody, we're here at Toward the Science of Consciousness 2010 in Tucson, Arizona. It's a grand event, people from all over the world, from all kinds of disciplines, interested in the problem of consciousness, how the brain produces it, whether it exists at large in the universe, where does it come from, what is it, how can we preserve it. In 1995, Roger Penrose and I, Sir Roger Penrose and I, came out with a theory of consciousness called orchestrated objective reduction. The basic idea is that inside neurons in the brain are these structures called microtubules, which look something like this, which we think are computers, not only regular computers, molecular computers, but quantum computers, whose properties in, in quantum computation are tied to the fundamental level of the universe in space-time geometry, from which come qualia, uh, feelings, emotions, as well as mass spinner charge, and give some possibility for spirituality throughout the world. In any case, Putting that aside, there are specific biological uh, aspects of it, and we've been attacked ever since the theory came out by AI interests, artificial intelligence, who see us as a threat, because according to us, uh, brain equivalence in computers is not inevitable and imminent. So uh, they, they funded a number of studies, including two recent studies by a group of Australian scientists uh, aimed at discrediting and refuting and getting rid of orca war so they can move in, presumably, because they're also interested in microtubules. Anyway, the most recent paper was published uh, uh, last summer in Phys Revy, and it basically takes issue with the tubulant bit or qubit in ORC OR. That's the basic uh, fundamental issue. But let me just back up and give uh, somewhat of an overview of the, of the ORC OR theory. Here's a microtubule. There's uh, uh, hundreds of these uh, cylinders inside neurons making up the architecture or the structure of neurons and there's hollow cylinders whose walls are made up of these peanut-shaped proteins called tubulin. And our idea is basically that each peanut-shaped tubulin can flip between two states driven by the electron movements in internal pockets called hydrophobic pockets. And these can also be quantum bits or qubits in both possible states at the same time. This is the qubit or quantum bit. Now the mechanical change is a cartoon. It needn't, it needn't be that, that significant a change. So with these two bits, two possible states, blue and red, or gray, both, both states, the microtubule lattice shown here by cellular automata functioning uh, roughly uh, in the megahertz range is changing shape and is processing and computing information. And when the quantum uh, state goes in, it reaches threshold here for Penrose or OR, and this is when consciousness happens, a moment of consciousness, the sequence of, uh, recurs. We think this happens in microtubules throughout roughly millions of neurons in the brain every uh, 40 times a second, 25 milliseconds, corresponding with gamma synchrony EEG. Okay, so far so good, right? Well, the chemist and I'll come along and say, wait a second, let's look at the bit qubit. And they say that it's biologically unfeasible and cannot even be fixed. Uh, so why do they say that? Well, they take the example of tubulin, which self-assemble to form microtubules. So in many cells, microtubules are growing, shrinking, forming, uh, and treadmilling. Uh, tubulins add on at one end uh, and then fall off the other, so the microtubule is treadmilling. The ones who add on the end, this is their model of a, of a tubulin. And it has, this is the, uh, the alpha and the beta. The beta's on top for some strange reason. But uh, there's two sites for GTP, which is an energy, energy source, like ATP, but GTP is what microtubules use. So on the, uh, on the alpha monomer here, there's a non-exchangeable site, so it always stays as GDP, G, sorry, GTP here and here. But the top one, the beta monomer, at some point in the microtubule lattice gets hydrolyzed to go to GDP, giving off energy and a phosphate bond, and it's irreversible. So once that happens, the microtubule starts to fall apart. They say that this is what we're referring to. It's unstable, and every time there's a flip, you require GTP, and you get one bit of information until the thing falls out. That is a really stupid way to have a microtubule computer. That's what they say we say, but we don't say that at all. We're not that dumb. They apparently are, because that's what they say. So why don't we say that? Well, one reason is that the microtubules in neurons in the, in the brain in the dendrites, which is where we say orco or occurs, don't have this treadmilling and dynamic instability. They're capped on both ends by stop proteins, so they say stable. Therefore, they don't need GTP hydrolysis, which would mess up the quantum coherence. So, you might ask, why do they move? Why do they vibrate uh, coherently and switch back and forth, which we need? Uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, what we say here, and what McKemish should all uh, uh, criticize, is that we say this electron 
in a hydrophobic pocket is flipping back and forth, and it's in an aromatic ring, something like benzene or phenyl ring in, in, uh, in benzene. But they say, if I move over here, that that type of benzene can flip back and forth, but actually is usually, the electron is usually totally delocalized and therefore can flip back and forth. Expecting some kind of uh, oscillation here would be like the, expecting the sound of one hand clapping because for oscillation, you need to get several of these types of rings together as what happens inside proteins in regions called hydrophobic pockets, which is the site of action of anesthetic gases. Anesthetic gases put you to sleep by floating into these hydrophobic pockets and blocking these Van der Waals London forces. Van der Waals London forces are shown here by these, these lines inside. They're basically the double rings or the, or the free mobile electrons in these hydrophobic pockets, which are coalescences of nonpolar groups. And they are like the brain of each protein. And the anesthetic gas, gas gets in there and prevents it from moving back and forth. And they can also be in quantum superposition in both states, unlike the benzene ring. So this is what we say. McCamish should all criticize this, which we don't say. They criticize this, which we don't say. And they criticize this, which we don't say. They don't criticize what we do say. What we do say is that the London forces are going back and forth, and they are governing uh, the state of the protein. Now, they do, we did cause some confusion. I'll have to give them that, so let me clarify that now. The qubit in ORCOR. In 1996, we came out with a model, and the idea was that the protein switched between two states coupled by one electron in the hydrophobic pocket. This is the nonpolar hydrophobic pocket, and the idea is that the state of the protein is coupled to the uh, movement of an electron, and the electron is in both states, the protein is in superposition. This was meant to be a cartoon. Uh, never did we uh, imply for uh, that actually one electron. It's just a simplification. Anyway, in 1998, we clarified that and showed two portions of aromatic rings in which the electron flips back and forth and can be in superposition in both states, and the protein is in superposition in both states. In 2007, it evolved a bit more, and we uh, brought four rings together with uh, Van der Waals forces interacting among the four rings, flipping back and forth. So if the dipole is this way, the protein's blue and open. If it's this way, it's red and closed, and it can be in superposition of both possible states. So, Given their objection that, and it, it, that this much movement is unfeasible, and they're right about that, <coughs> it would require GTP hydrolysis, it would generate a lot of heat, and uh, it, would, it would disrupt uh, coherence. Uh, but we never implied that. We don't need a mechanical movement. So here is the 2010 version of the tubulin uh, in Orc OR, and it's based on this uh, X-ray crystallographic structure by Tusinski's group in Canada of tubulin. So this is the actual tubulin. Everything else that I've drawn are cartoons. So in the tubulin, you see that there's a big hydrophobic pocket here, which is binding a protein, call, uh, a, a drug called paclitaxel, or taxol, which is an anti-cancer drug, which prevents microtubules from uh, undergoing assembly disassembly in mitosis, or stabilizes them so they can't do it. So that's one hydrophobic pocket. But also, we see these rings here, 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 one back here, 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 here. So these are, there are multiple hydrophobic pockets, not just one as we showed in our previous uh, versions. So this is the 2010 cartoon version of the ORCOR qubit based on this actual structure in which we have a number of nonpolar hydrophobic pockets um, represented by these uh, aromatic rings with the London forces all pointing in this direction, therefore it's in the red state.